there's an incredibly fine line, a paper thin line, probably even thinner than that, between someone who is a dreamer and someone who is greedy. When I think of a dreamer, I think of someone who is so on fire with his or her mission that they're not really even focused on the money. A dreamer has named his or her price up front. And no matter what, there are certain things that a dreamer just will not do. Because a dreamer has values. And every action a dreamer takes is consistent with the type of person that dreamer wants to be at the end of his or her life. And also, those actions are consistent with where they want to go with their dreams. Let's compare that to someone who is greedy. When I think of one who is greedy, I think of one who was likely a dreamer at one point, then just did one small thing that was not consistent with his or her values. And then that one unethical action turned into an avalanche of unethical actions, the type of avalanche that crushes cities and they lost sight of why they started their mission in life and sold out. A greedy person exemplifies the ugliest trait a human being can demonstrate, which is selfishness. A little bit of selfishness is good doing whatever it takes and stepping on the little guy without even any good reason why, especially, you've crossed over to greedy. And that line between a dreamer and greed should be a little bit different for each person. For example, Someone who is single and does not have anyone depending on him or her for income or food or shelter, they could be a little more selfish with their time. They could work later nights more consistently. But if someone who is a dad, for example, it might cross over into selfishness or greed if that dad spent the same amount of time at work versus someone who does not have others relying on them. Just an example. And I prepared two sketches, which I sketched this morning to explain precisely 
where my fine line that I draw between dreamer Dayton and greedy Dayton is. One of the following sketches represents me dreaming. The other sketch represents me being greedy. Now I'm not gonna tell you which sketch is which, I'm gonna show you the first sketch and then let the viewers decide if they think that sketch is me dreaming or me being greedy. And y'all don't have to play along. I'm, not, I'm never gonna see you. So if you don't play my game, that's cool. But I'm gonna pretend you are. Sketch number one. as you can see, this is a castle. You've got, you've got water, which should really say moat, with a drawbridge. And then you've got Princess Nova, that's my dog. And then you have four pillars all shaped like rooks from the game of chess. <sighs> this castle will one day reside on my island, which will be named Rook Island after the second most powerful attacking piece in the game of chess to remind me I didn't want to do queens because that could lead to complacency. So my castle on Rook Island will be Rooks to remind me to remember like just, just a little bit how second taste. This island will only be accessed via a Rook-shaped helicopter. There will be four snipers on each of the rook pillars, one on each rook pillar. Those snipers will be given strict instructions to shoot down anything that is not the one night stand rook shaped helicopter. Is what I just described greedy? Or is that sketch just good old fashioned dreaming? A castle on a remote island during uncertain times economically? I'm dreaming. Ain't nothing greedy about that. Which means if that sketch was not greedy, the sketch I'm about to show you would be the one that crosses that line over to the dark side. Sketch number two. Okay. Let's see. Now, as you'll notice, this sketch is extremely similar to sketch number one. It's got the four rook-shaped pillars. It's got Princess Nova. In fact, it's almost as if I just scan this first sketch and added just one small detail. Do y'all notice the one small difference between Rook Island Castle number one and Rook Island Castle number two here? I'll give you five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. I count fast, sorry. If you guessed there were two starved alligators in the moat on the second drawing. You are correct. There's my line. I don't need 
starved alligators in my moat on Rook Island. It's excessive. And not only to locate alligators that fit what I'm looking for in terms of they would need to be cruel alligators, but trained smart enough to know they need to eat anything and everything that is not my dog Nova. Transporting the alligators there would be a chore. And I would need to find out how to feed those alligators just enough to where they had the energy to fight off any bad guys trying to break in to Rook Island. But I don't want to feed them so much that they aren't hungry enough to devour anyone crazy enough to cross a moat <laughs> with alligators in it. And I could make a strong, compelling argument that the greedy sketch with alligators is still dreaming and that the alligators are essential. I'd be pushing it, but if I had to make that argument for alligators in my moat, Here's how I would frame that argument. The world has a lot of evil in it, a lot of good too, but the world can be evil. But I don't want Nova to ever see any evil. I'm like the giver in that book from a while back where I want to take all the bad stuff, put it in my brain before it gets to Nova. And most any human is capable of swimming through or across a moat filled with only water. But even Michael Phelps is going to have a real tough time swimming across a moat with starved alligators in it. For Nova's safety, I need those gators. I don't have a CFO right now, so I'd probably sign off on that. The only one I would trust to babysit or rescue Nova from that castle in case of an emergency Aside from me, maybe Shrek, because he treated Fiona real well when he rescued her. So there's my line between dreaming and greedy. I hope you have yours drawn and you've named your price early. Otherwise, you'll sell out when times get tough. Let's get a song. Let's play some chess. I fell asleep beneath the flowers for a couple of hours. What a beautiful day. The day beneath the flowers.
I think Lupe has been through some more crap than I have personally. I'm not even crazy enough to fight the White House, Lupe. That's ballsy. I was for a day. Daydream. I was a couple of hours for a day. Okay, it's not cool, Lupe. Fell asleep beneath the flowers for a couple of hours. Beautiful day, daydream. Flowers, full of hours. Such a beautiful day. Bar chords. Blue hours. What a beautiful day. She is like a super talented ghost. I don't know if you can hear that. If I heard that in a haunted house, I don't know if I'd dance or cry. Maybe both. I'm becoming an even bigger Lupe fan. Not just because he's very talented, but I researched his personal life and history just a bit last night. And he's also got a very healthy skepticism towards authority. And I like that. But what we don't have in common, me and Lupe, is he's more talented far more famous, which is good because I'm kind of a loner. And he's about $15 million wealthier than I am. But on the important intrinsic factors, me and Lupe are somewhat similar. But where no one is similar to me, is my approach to chess. It's not to say no one's better than me because at least a couple million, according to chess.com, are better than me at chess. I, I won't debate all of them. Um, let's see. Yeah, globally, let's see here. I'm 1,140,000. Oh my gosh, I need to work on that. All right, so I haven't broken the top 1 million, but no one approaches chess the way I do, which is I die for it. And I've spent a lot of time developing 
a very specific training program, which I review once a week to make sure it addresses my weaknesses. And that's why that 1 million is gonna be losing a lot of digits, about six of them until it's just number one. All right, this is a guy that I friended just because he was far better than me and I need to play stronger enemies. And I'm gonna to need to think about that move because I don't like losing to him. So I'm not gonna play him back right now. No, no, get out of here. No. Okay, now, here we go. Play. No. Does it go, it go straight there every time? No, I just want to play. I don't want to play drift idiot. No. They're not supposed to see that I'm re-recording because I lost. Okay. Play. New game. Thank goodness. Man, I was hoping chess.com lives in the past it's a computer thing i guess even when you clear history or clear cash or clear your cookies or whatever you know what i mean right no that's not it control shift delete maybe shift and delete whatever i don't have enough hands but when you clear history you know, I'm sure they say it's cleared. It's not cleared. But on chess.com, they need to come up with something where when I go in to do my podcast, it doesn't show a loss from the past because two things, I don't like living in the past. That's thing number one. The second thing is I don't lose. Chess.com messed me up there. I'd like to stay on chess.com's good side because I applied for one of their jobs. Better not try to go to war with them in a legal battle over ruining my reputation for showing a loss when I'm recording my podcast, but you'll see that it's there. At least my dedication is strong enough that you know I'm spending another hour recording a second battle for you to not see an enemy checkmating me. Right. I was checking my notes, my outline for the week, but it's covered up and I can't see it anyway. And it's good that I can't read my weekly outline. Because my podcast comes from the heart, not a script. You can't fake this much love that you're about to see. I am concerned though. Anyone who's viewed my previous videos would likely agree with the following statement. I kick a lot more ass when I'm silent during my opening but this is a podcast too which, which would imply talking throughout most of the session and that's why a mime wouldn't make a real entertaining podcast host like a mime you know all that stuff if I heard a mime was going to start a podcast, I'd watch one episode just because I'd be curious. But I can't imagine that wouldn't get repetitive. So I don't want to be a mime and not talk during my opening. But I don't want to lose either. I need to come up with something that I can do to entertain during the open, but that something needs to be requiring little of my mental resources, something that I'm comfortable or familiar with, 
so I can still really lock in on the opening. And I should have prepared better because I don't have that in my toolbox right now. So I'm gonna start this game. And if I have to be quiet for one more week's podcast during my opening game, I'll figure something out for next week, but hopefully something comes to mind and you don't just have to watch me play a perfect opening game. Because I want you to watch me play a perfect open with a little bit of talking too. One focus point for this week. The one focus point for this week's battle. I've been studying the Sicilian defense and I'm a big fan. So if you get the chance to play black, let's do the Sicilian defense thing. Duel. Ooh, we're black and we're playing the Sicilian defense, baby. There we go. All right. And then I believe there's three options that, that are acceptable in the Sicilian defense for move number two for black. And I don't know that he was supposed to do that necessarily, but I know D6 was, was if I remember right, the most common option. Check my notes. Uh, I just had my, I have my chess board still set up when I was analyzing the Sicilian defense. So it's still got a few pieces, but I didn't recall if enemy was supposed to do that. Um, okay, that's fine. Yeah, we'll do that. you might do that. Um. Okay. Right, lock in, get to the open, or get to, get to the middle game. that double covered so he does have access to that square. Now your horse is not riding off anywhere because if your horse starts riding, your queen would not be exposed now because you corrected that error. Don't rush to castle just because you want to run your mouth. Still need to play a good open. You're going to do that. Interesting. Mm 
Give me night stick. He's going to sneak in. I'm thinking he's got a curfew. He's not sneaking anywhere. Okay, my thought is now enemy knight can't defend. Now he can. Okay. That's cool, though. check get your probably gonna get your queen out i would assume would be the wise choice my friend okay comes down okay middle game it is I'll have something planned, maybe poetry or something for the open of next week's battle. Okay. So I'm either going there or there. My The advantage of there would be Enemy goes there, he could force me now. If I go there, enemy goes. I'm gonna go there and here's why. It's not a longer game where I can really calculate this, but my thought is that way, if I'm able to win either of those two pawns, I'd love to steal that pawn because then I can force the rook to move also, prevent a castle. That's fine. Okay. Tell you why I did that. So now I'm either getting that pawn or enemy horse is gonna have to do some stuff because I've got double pressure on enemy E pawn with my queen and my knight. And all he's got is his queen. Queens are real good. Knights combined with a queen. Trump's enemy one queen. And he's realizing that right now, and he's real sad about it. That seems silly. What are you doing, pal? Okay, so you're not, you're thinking you're putting pressure on my queen. I'm thinking my queen doesn't feel pressure. But yours does now. Thank you. Which is why I'm plus one, baby. And enemy's still waiting to castle. Enemy's hoping he ever gets a chance to castle. It's in the game of life and chess. You need to take advantage of your chances at that very moment. And enemy might have waited just too long where he'll never get that chance. It's sad, but life can be. Okay, and your life's gonna be sad if you don't start using some clock better, let's go. Enemy can have my D pawn if he wants it, because you know I'll be taking enemy. Um, enemy knight with my rook. And sure. We, no, because then I'd be blocking my pawn. That'd be bad. Okay. So now what you're going to do is you're going to figure out how valuable your knight is to you.
Each every little piece counts when you're playing me. All right, sounds good. That is fine. All right, get out of there, please. Nope, I don't want to do that because now you do have double. Yeah, well. My pawn's real involved in a lot of ways just because I really just can sense an ass kicking coming and I'm practicing now. I don't like practicing while I'm on stage, but I gotta get my practice in somehow. And when you're far better than the enemies who happen to appear when you're hosting your podcast, you take advantage of when you, when you can practice. And that's right now. <laughs> Your rook is unsafe. And now I'm in forking territory. I learned about discoveries. I believe over the weekend, I took a lesson on discoveries. Essentially a discovery is when like, I don't see a good example now, but but like if my rook were covered up by another piece, when that piece moved, then my rook would be discovering an attacking opportunity. I'd have to show you. Oh, see, enemy's trying to discover right now. He's trying to put me in check. And then, yeah, I could take enemy knight, but I'd be in check, so I couldn't actually. Um, that'd be problematic for me. Good try, enemy. Great try, actually. I respect that effort. Almost to an, I, I almost respect that tactic that he was trying to do, which is enemy knight to b6. And then I'd be in check, so I'd have to slide. Because it would appear I'm winning a knight, but really enemy rook would have me in check. I respect the cleverness, but I don't respect the enemy. He just happened to have made one good decision to try to salvage this ass kicking before it's finalized. But this ass kicking will be finalized in a very short amount of time. Oh, nope, he's got double on that. So we need to go. There would be good. Enemy bishop wants to screw with it. I've got a pawn to capture it or my rook to capture it, which is why enemy is about to get forked for me to more or less close out this game. I'm thinking. My knight bounces to f3. It'd be great if I could have that pawn sound f3. No, man. You know I was about to do that to you. That's all right. You saw what I was thinking, though. Fork. I've got enemy king in check. I take enemy rook. But enemy's trying to put up a fight. Again, it's sad, but... But also, I get it. I get it. Okay, let's start trading a few pieces. Then I'll probably promote one of my pawns to a queen. Get my W and wrap this podcast up. Be smart, yep. You need to make great use of your pawns here. Don't let them have one. Pawns aren't for sharing. All right, boom, boom, that's fine. 
my rook, my rook, my rook, what are you doing? Okay, so now I'm gonna need one of enemy's pawns, ideally two. I almost lost concentration and let him steal my rook, which I'm feeling confident today. So I think I could have bounced back somehow, but it would be better to not show off and just keep my rook safe. The rooks in this single battle are not as valuable as my rooks on my Rook Island castle will be one day. But nonetheless, a Rook is valuable and every piece does count, okay? That's fine. Any forking opportunities for you? That's the only way I let you back in. I see none, which is why you're toast once again. Because I'm getting one pawn here, you can't save them. I would, I would have loved to have rewound that last move and stole enemy B pawn with my bishop. But again, rewinding time is not something I've been able to figure out at this point. So we'll settle here. Enemy rook wants to steal my rook. I'm stealing enemy rook with my bishop. I'm promoting one pawn to a queen and ruining this guy's day early. Okay. Yep. That's cool. We'll be seeing you. This is kind of cute that you're putting up a fight. My surrender flag is in my drawer and ready to go. If you want to make your life easier, I mean, it is, it is a Monday, so I don't know what time it is in Indonesia. I better not look right now just for clock management purposes, but I'm getting greedy. Okay, so right now it would appear to be 4.54 a.m. in Indonesia, which I guess that would be Tuesday there. If enemy is a corporate type of person, I don't know how Indonesia business works. I don't know how his Monday went at work. Um, but even if it was a real bad Monday for this Indonesian, Tuesday is going to be worse after this loss. Your boss must be pretty laid back because you need to go see your therapist before you go to work, man. You're running out of time. Okay, just focus here. Enemy knight can go there. Probably be wise. Try to play some type of defense or make me run out of time before I promote a pawn to a queen and crush your dreams. Um, enemy knight can't go there. So my pawn captures. Enemy knight can't go there, can't go there. Only place enemy knight would wanna go would be there or there. So he'd be wise to either resign or try to get lucky with some pawns. But if enemy thinks he's gonna get lucky and promote one of these pawns to a queen to salvage this ass kicking, I do believe I've had more lucky days after seeing a black cat and walking under a ladder like 17 times. Surrender flag is ready to go. Yeah. All right. Just gonna get my revenge on the chess playing robot supercomputer real quick. This was not part of the script for this week. All right, let's see if this. No, 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 not no. I want to go to the end of the last game. No, get this. All right, fine. Okay, so what I want to do? We're gonna go to the end. Now I'm gonna get my revenge against Maximum. Let's go, Maximum. Yeah, see if you can clean up this mess, Maximum. I doubt you can. Knock on wood, of course. Okay. There we go. A3 is best. Get my face out of there. Okay. You want to go there? You can. 
If you go there, take my bishop, if I'm there, yeah, then you can bounce back and still get me, so I better not do that. Better go there. Mm. No maximum. <laughs> it would appear one of us have gotten better since our last duel, and it would appear that the other of us, which is you, maximum, perfect computer playing robot. It's like you've stayed about the same, which is perfect. Um, okay. I'm going to need a queen because this robot is real good at chess. Okay. All right. And now what we're going to do is let you steal my queen with your knight. We're gonna get your knight off the board and I'm gonna pray that I don't somehow allow you to get that pawn across because I have a healthy respect for even these lower level enemies which you frequently see me dominate. So I have a real healthy respect for perfect computer playing robots, which is why. I'm only gonna screw with this robot a little bit, like right here. You can have my bishop robot. I don't want it. Because now I'm gonna take your pawn so that you're defenseless. I'm gonna allow you to have my pawn and now I'm getting my revenge, which is a scary thing. But sometimes chess playing robots deserve a little bit of their own medicine which is why I'm screwing with him a little bit. You can have it. You're not gonna take my pawn. Why? Take my pawn, maximum. Okay, fine. If you don't want my pawn, I'm just gonna finish you off. Goodness gracious, stupid robot. That's a sign COVID needs to end completely. When I'm getting my confidence by defeating, and not only defeating, but, but toying with a chess robot. I need help. Or just a chess instructor. All right. Oh, man, you deserve this. You deserve this. Where are you going, Maximum? Nowhere. Nowhere is where you're going. Yep, struggle. Just like you made me struggle last week. Line them up. Line them up. Do you need the surrender flag maximum? Too proud to surrender. I thought you might be. Come on back. We'll be seeing you, perfect computer bot. I don't think robots cry, but if they do, you're going to need a mop. Okay. So you just saw me not only defeat the enemy but also get a cheap win against a perfect computer playing robot that certainly needed, I don't know what gender maximum is, but, but that perfect robot needed his confidence lowered and, and it got lowered just now. Uh, wrap it up with a story. I'll tell you a story about why, hate's a strong word, especially when hate is a personal insult. Like, like I'm gonna say, I hate most aspects of social media, but I'm not gonna say I hate 
social media because then I'm attacking it and I'm kind of a bully. I just hate most everything that social media stands for. One of those things I hate about social media, I realized after rereading this article from a Harvard dude, way smarter than me, called Overloaded Circuits, Why Smart People Underperform. If I print something out to read it, it's probably important. And I'm not a certified psychologist because my psychologist is way smarter than I'll ever be. But just like I'm not a certified grandmaster, I know enough and I can explain what the real people know on a scaled down, funnier type of way. So let me break that article down for you. We have two, we have two main settings in our human brains. I believe the term that article uses for the first is like executive functioning, which basically is the first one is logical thought. Call it whatever you want, smart Harvard professor. The first setting is logical. It's where you want to be, especially if you're doing something that requires good decision making such as chess, surgery. Being a CEO, if you're not being controlled by the stockholders, you'd want to have the logic. Teachers, so you don't tell parents that not everyone's child is Albert Einstein, even though logically, not every kid is as smart as Albert Einstein, but you can't say that to some parents. The second setting in our brains, I believe the article calls it survival mode. I call it human nature. It's the emotional decision-making process. And that is scary because the second setting in our brain, the emotional one, it's triggered by multitasking, severe stress, sleep deprivation. And that article even compares that second type of thinking to what our ancestors might have resorted to when a man eating tiger was chasing them, fight or flight. And you got to fight and flight in chess. That's why I prefer the first setting. And social media is very good at provoking that second less pleasant brain setting. That's why I don't hate Facebook. I just hate using Facebook personally because it ain't good for my brain. Because I'm trying to rule the chess world. Um, and now, without further buildup, I'm going to close this week's podcast out with a poem, a poem that is not plagiarized. It's written by me. This poem was inspired by me. Therefore, this unplagiarized, inspired by me poem will be read by me. Social media is a tool which can 
make us negative and cruel. Facebook needs our time. But our time is often best kept through lies. And though I've never met Mark, Mark might be an angel at heart. Zuckerberg can't have my time. I'm playing chess. You know, I don't read scripts. We'll see you next week.